Well, welcome everybody again to the NOAA Center for Marine Science Science Talk series. We're really excited to um, see you all tonight and to host our latest speaker. My name is Sheila Siemens. I'm the director of the NOAA Center for Marine Science. And um, I just wanted to point out that we're celebrating our 10th year, 10th year of bringing you science um, events just like this. Uh, we have a... Um, a monthly science talk series. If you're new to us, thank you for joining us. We have all of our um, past science talks posted on our website, so feel free to to look at those and, and see some of the incredible speakers that we've had in the past. But tonight, we want to welcome Elizabeth Selinger from uh, UC Davis, the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department, and the Bodega Marine Lab. Very exciting. Um, She's a PhD student, and we're really excited to hear about her work working with seagrass. It's part of this uh, effort that we're doing to talk more about climate change in general and some of the things people are doing to try to understand impacts and mitigate impacts to climate change. Um, seagrass, you know, as you know, we're working on kelp all the time, but seagrass is a little bit, a bit better understood from a carbon sequestration standpoint. So I'm excited to see where. Elizabeth's research is taking her. Uh, with that, Elizabeth, if you want to take it over, I will um, mute myself and let you take the stage. So thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you for that introduction. I will share my screen. Is that looking okay for everyone? Okay, great. Um, minimize this. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So thanks for coming out today. Um, I'm super excited to be here and to talk about my research today um, and explore seagrass as a climate change solution. So get straight into it. Um, okay. Uh, I wanted to start off with a little bit about me. Um, I'm a second year PhD student at UC Davis, and I study coastal marine systems. I was born in San Francisco and then lived in Singapore for five years, and then I moved back to California um, and then over to Colorado when I was 13. I went to the University of Colorado Boulder, where I studied ecology and evolutionary biology and also atmospheric and oceanic sciences. And now I am back here in California um, for, to be in Davis and for school. So lots of moving. <laughs> um, I, I grew up around the ocean and I always felt I was connected to it as a sense of home, but it wasn't, it wasn't really until I took a marine biology course in Hawaii in high school uh, that I learned that I kind of wanted to do this for real and I wanted to become some sort of a marine scientist. And um, although I attended a landlocked school, I attended um, or I took advantage of a lot of the cool opportunities that um, University of Colorado Boulder had to offer, and I also did an internship at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, but fast forward to today, um, this is a little snippet from my website, um, but I like to include when I'm not doing research, I'm, um, if you know, not catching up on rest and things like that, you'll find me exploring and hiking, baking and cooking. I love to cook. I'm a huge foodie. Um, hanging out with animals and just adventuring and eating. Those are my top things. Okay, um, but getting into my talk today, here is a brief outline. I'm going to give an overview of climate change and the motivations behind my research and then move into some seagrass background, um, why it needs help and how we can help. And then I will talk about my research in California and then end with what's next and some positive thoughts on climate change, because I think we all need the, that these days, myself included. Um, this is an image uh, at Elkhorn Slough in California, kind of just north of Monterey. It's one of my field sites, and I will get into that a little later, but it's a really pretty picture of some seagrass. All right, so first up, some background information. Um, I wanted to begin with describing the greenhouse gas effect. So our Earth is blanketed in a bunch of different gases in our atmosphere. Without them, we would not be able to, to survive on Earth. There would be no air to breathe. It would be super cold. So yes, uh, the greenhouse gas effect is good. Um, we need gases like carbon dioxide in our atmosphere to survive. 
But the problem begins when we start burning fossil fuels in excess, which releases carbon dioxide at really alarming rates. Um, so here on the left, we have the Earth with a balanced amount of greenhouse gas, as we can say. So the sun's energy enters the atmosphere, um, some of it's absorbed by the atmosphere, and then some of it's released back into space. And on the right-hand side, we have what we call a carbon dioxide enhanced atmosphere, this little red line. So the excess carbon dioxide traps more of the sun's energy, causing the Earth to warm. Um, so kind of think of it if they're, if it's a blanket on Earth, that it's kind of thickened the blanket on that side, a little bit warmer now. Um, the right side is what we're currently experiencing, um, a warming climate due to burning fossil fuels and releasing carbon dioxide, like I said, at pretty alarming rates. And let's take a look at those rates. So this graph is called the Keeling Curve. Um, it's carbon dioxide measurements that have been taken on Mauna Loa on the Big Island of Hawaii and have been uh, since the 1960s at the end of this graph here. Um, so looking at this graph, we have carbon dioxide on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And as we can see that through time, um, carbon dioxide is increasing. And right now uh, we're hovering about 420 parts per million um, of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And that, that may not seem like much, but carbon dioxide is really good at trapping heat. So even small amounts make a pretty big difference. And also scientists have been able to use sort of sort of a fingerprinting method to show that this new carbon dioxide is actually from human activity. But okay, looking back at this graph, it, it doesn't look that steep, right? Or there's no context for it. Like sure, it's increasing, but don't things on earth like this kind of naturally fluctuate over time? And so that's when I like to show this graph. Um, it's somewhat of an extended Keeling curve. This plot um, also shows carbon dioxide through time, but this time it goes back 800,000 years. Um, it's not exactly geologic time, but pretty far back. And so these data were obtained through ice cores, which kind of almost serve as, as like time capsules. Within the ice core, there are these trapped bubbles, which contain the air from the atmosphere at the time it was trapped. So scientists are able to date the ice and measure the, the gas content in the bubbles and then reconstruct what the atmosphere looked like in the past. And so as we can see, the carbon dioxide does fluctuate in the past, but never at the rate we are seeing now. I'll bring your attention to the very end of this graph where it says zero thousands of years ago, and it's pointing to all the different dates. So this line that we see here is that incredibly straight looking line at the very end. Um, so that this is this unprecedented rate is why climate change is such a big problem. Our Earth cannot react at the same rate as we are pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so what does a warming climate mean? Um, it means more frequent severe weather events like fires, storms, floods, droughts. I think things that unfortunately a lot of us are becoming a little familiar with. Um, a loss of species, which is throwing a lot of our ecosystems out of balance, uh, sea level rise as polar ice melts, so kind of inundating a lot of island nations, um, more acidic ocean waters from increased carbon dioxide content, uh, food insecurity as it gets uh, more difficult to grow and maintain crops, and then increased health threats since disease travels and grows better in warmer climates, something we saw firsthand with the COVID pandemic. Um, but fortunately, it's not all doom and gloom. Hopefully my talk is not about that today because um, we as individuals can help and we know of solutions large corporations and nations need to take to reduce our carbon emissions. That's when the big thing comes in. We need to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, we need to lower food waste, uh, decrease our dependence on fossil fuels in terms of traveling, shop more locally, invest in renewable energy, and just uh, more generally in green ideas, create carbon caps on companies. Uh, these, these are just a few. There's so many things that we can do. But at this point, we also know that even if we do all these things, it won't be enough um, to hit these certain targets that we're looking at. Uh, we also need to remove some of the carbon in the atmosphere. And so that's where my research comes in with seagrass and its potential to store carbon long-term and where we are going next in this talk. Okay, so moving on, uh, let's talk about all the wonders of seagrass and how it can help us tackle this problem. 
Uh, first of all, what is seagrass? Um, this is when I had a little poll idea. I'm not sure if it'll work. Um, if we can post the poll. Uh, let's see, polls, quizzes, launch. That's showing up for people. I kind of wanted to know if A, you've ever seen or interacted with seagrass. Um, and then if you have, what was your interaction for? Are you there for, for recreation or do you live around there? Um, that kind of thing. Okay, so I'm getting a few, quite a few no's, some maybes. Okay, interesting. So far, I guess maybe most people know. I won't leave this up for too long, but I just kind of wanted to get. Well, the yeses are idea. pulling ahead. <laughs> Sorry? The yeses are pulling ahead. Yeah, the yeses are slowly coming in. People have seen seagrass. Yay. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll close it after a minute. So seven more seconds just to get us engaged in the front of the talk. Hopefully it'll be engaging the whole time though. Okay, I'll end it now. Um, great. So that's really interesting to know. I guess I didn't see the short answers, but I can read those later. Um, Okay, so about half of us have seen or interacted with seagrass, 35% no, 15% maybe. I included this maybe because sometimes we see plants or green stuff in the ocean and we're not quite sure what it is. Um, okay, cool. So I will tell you what seagrass is. Um, seagrass is a marine flowering plant. So just like grass on land, uh, seagrass has these long green stalks or blades, usually what we call them, and then roots that go into the sediment, um, and they need water, sunlight, and nutrients to perform photosynthesis and to grow. Uh, so this picture my colleague Melissa Ward took in Tamales Bay, California, another one of my research sites, of eelgrass, which is the species of seagrass that it grows in California. Um, it's perennial, so it comes back each year, and seasonal, so like land plants, they kind of flourish in the spring and summer, and then die back in the fall and winter. And then these are what seagrass sprouts look like. So they grow off these horizontal root structures, um, and one of these, these collections is, is one plant. So you can have like multiple sprouts coming up from one plant, and they can actually you can have a whole meadow, which is essentially one plant or one organism, which is pretty cool. It kind of reminds me of like aspen trees, just because I was lived in Colorado. Okay, um, some common uses, both historically among indigenous tribes and then also into today, include um, furniture making. This is obviously a very modern, recent photo, um, but basket weaving, building insulation. This was really cool when I learned about it. I didn't know that you could do that. Um, paper making and mattress stuffing. So tons of really cool uses, um, not really used at an industrial scale, but still <laughs> useful. And then this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a foodie. So when I came upon this story, I was super interested. But another cool use of seagrass is what they call marine rice. So a Michelin star chef in in Spain is building off of more of the traditional and cultural uses of seagrass seeds as a form of edible rice. So he has his own meadows, which he farms and uses it in his restaurants. And now a life goal of mine is to try it and kind of combine my love for food and seagrass. But that's another story I thought I'd just pop it in. Okay, so besides these really cool uses, why should we care? Well, seagrass provide a ton of benefits to both us as humans and the coastal marine ecosystem in general. Uh, they slow water movement, which can help protect the coasts from storms and erosion. They provide habitat for a lot of the baby marine species, so kind of like a nursery habitat. Um, they help reduce local ocean acidification conditions as they consume the carbon dioxide. Oh, go ahead. Is there someone talking? I don't think so. Sorry. Okay. Um, like I was saying, they, they consume the carbon dioxide in the water while performing photosynthesis and then filter the water from bacteria, pollutants, excess nutrients. So essentially improving the water quality and pulling, oh, improving uh, the water quality because they pull these sediments out that are floating in the water and they kind of settle down to the bottom and then they keep them there. So the water is just clear. Um, and also 
because they house so many marine creatures and are essentially just these beautiful underwater forests, um, they have a really strong cultural value. So a lot of tourism and recreational opportunities. Um, if, if all these benefits weren't enough, they also are really important for fisheries as they provide healthy habitat for a lot of commercial fisheries and aquaculture. So seagrasses are these, what we call like cool powerhouses of co-benefits. They do a lot of things all at once. Um, in terms of monetary value and incentives, seagrasses are worth a lot. These are things that California's estate consider frequently. So we kind of have to, you know, talk about them. So coastal protection is one of uh, a big one. It's protecting our infrastructure from millions of damages of uh, dollars of damage each year um, with tourism by helping support local businesses. And then finally with carbon credits. So put a little star right here um, or just more generally carbon storage, which is the main focus of the rest of the talk. Um, since this presentation is going to cover my research in particular, I kind of wanted to introduce some, some key questions that I'm interested in as we continue learning about seagrass and kind of orient our minds before we get to my actual research. So first I'm, I'm thinking about how does seagrass help with carbon storage? Um, second, where does it do that best? And third, how is it interacting with other ecosystems? So kind of thinking about these questions as I continue giving some background, and then also I'll go over them in more detail later. So with these questions in mind, I'm going to go over how seagrasses even store carbon in the first place. I briefly went over this earlier, but here's, here's a diagram illustrating photosynthesis. So there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which then dissolves into the ocean. Uh, the seagrass then uses this carbon along with water and sunlight to produce food for itself in the form of carbohydrates. And so this process uses carbon and it's transported up and down the plant. Uh, so carbon is sequestered both within these green shoots or blades and then eventually the, 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 the roots and then into the sediments where they grow. So that's kind of why I put this big C for carbon in the sediments here, point to it so we're all looking down there. Um, and then also as sediment travels through the water column, like I mentioned earlier, from other locations, uh, the seagrass blades kind of trap them and settle them to the bottom. And a fun fact is that a study showed, I think it was about half of the carbon in seagrass meadows aren't actually from the seagrasses themselves, but from other sources all around the seagrass. And they help trap and store that more permanently. So really cool. Um, I know this figure is a bit busy, but I wanted to show it just to show how seagrasses can interact with other ecosystems when we're considering my, that third question I was talking about. Um, so mangroves, salt marshes, seagrasses, and kelps are all what we call blue carbon systems since they store carbon and uh, they are in the ocean. It's kind of a blue carbon name. Um, as we can see, sediments uh, as sediments accumulate, they can store them for really long periods of time. So that's what this figure is kind of saying with the new carbon and then old carbon. And we also see that these different systems or ecosystems occupy different areas along the coast. So in the most shallow areas, kind of somewhat terrestrial, we have the salt marshes, then it moves into the mangroves, and then seagrass is in the middle, and then kelp are at the deepest. So just a quick note, because I didn't know this when I first started at the very beginning, um, seagrasses and kelp are not the same. So kelp is an algae and it grows in much deeper water, whereas seagrass is a plant and it grows in shallower water. So just, just a quick distinction. Um, unfortunately, we are losing and have lost a lot of seagrass in California, despite the importance and all those things that I mentioned. So uh, you can kind of read it here, but a combination of agricultural runoff, increasing temperatures, urban infrastructure, and all these buildings developing and dumping sediment into the areas where where seagrass are and kind of suffocating them, um, dredging, so just simply ripping them out, aquaculture use and damaging the seafloor, boating, invasive species, sea level rise, all the things, they're not good for seagrass. Um, and so a combination of all these things kind of has led to up to a 90% loss of seagrass in California compared to potential historical cover. And so that's a lot. Um, but that's why we are working on both conservation and restoration efforts. 
So first, seagrass is a federally protected species. You can't remove it or damage it in any way. Um, this is great, but we also need to help restore the 90% degraded meadows. Um, and there are two types of restoration. The first is active restoration. So this is where teams of people either take shoots from healthy donor beds and replant them, um, or they take the actual seeds and then replant those. So kind of looking at this figure, we see the donor bed, the seeds, and both of them they take and plant in these sparse areas. Um, another type is called passive restoration. And so this is where things that damage the seafloor, um, like boat moorings or other debris, are removed from an area to promote seagrass growth. So I kind of drew this here. So there's an anchor that's in this, uh, the sediment, the seafloor. There's a heavy chain that kind of runs along the bottom, and then a lighter chain that connects up to a buoy, which you can attach your boat to. Um, but the, that heavy chain along the bottom, as the water moves, kind of scours the area and prevents any growth. So here is an aerial image in Richardson Bay, California, of boat moorings, which are anchored to the seafloor and used to type the boats, as we can see. Um, and as the tide moves, the chain, the boat scrapes along, and you can kind of see these circular areas where there's just nothing growing. Um, there are alternatives to these traditional boat moorings where you kind of attach like floaties all along that heavier chain so nothing's ever scraping the floor and some other things, but we can also just remove them. Um, in terms of restoration, not all places have the same carbon storage potential or just even the potential of growth. Uh, seagrasses need to be relatively shallow so light can penetrate through the water to perform photosynthesis. Um, it can't be too salty or too fresh water. It kind of needs that Goldilocks in the middle, although it does have a pretty decent range. Um, the waves can't be too aggressive, so the system energy can't be too high, or it'll tear up the blades or rip them out from the sediment. Uh, if the water is too murky, it can't access sunlight. There needs to be a good balance of nutrients in the water. Um, well, there's also a lot of things in the, in the sediment itself with the chemistry, but that's a whole other story. Um, and I know I said earlier that seagrasses can help with all of these things, which they definitely can, but only to an extent. If you're completely drowned in sediment, then you can't really do much. Um, so here are a couple of images in areas in Elkhorn Slough, California, like I said, just north of Monterey, if you're not familiar, um, where I work that have seagrasses. And as you can see, they all look very different. Um, so they come in all different shapes and sizes and conditions. Just really quickly before I uh, have one more slide and then get over to my research, um, some scientists in Australia are looking into this question of best sites for carbon storage across the globe. And so what they've done is they've sent Lipton tea bags to people in a ton of different countries all over the world. They are having them bury the bags and then dig them up after I, it's three, six, 12, 24, and 36 months. Then they send them back to the laboratory in Australia um, and then there are these known rates of decay with these tea varieties. It's like, is it rooibos and maybe black tea, I think? Um, and it's called the tea bag index. So it's just this known, this known um, rate of decay. Um, and then scientists can use this decay rate to relate to the carbon storage potential of the site. So that's really cool. Um, the data is not released yet. They're still working on it. I'm sure they have so much data, but a really cool project. And then the last slide before I dive into my research, uh, we need to ask ourselves as researchers, what does it mean for a seagrass meadow to be healthy? Um, so first off, how are we defining success? As we've seen, every site looks a little different. So setting baseline goals before restoration is super important. We also need to consider what kinds of goals these are. Are they structural? Do do we only care about how many shoots there are, how much space they cover, or how dense the meadows are? Or are redefining success as more structural values? So do, do they provide habitat for a diverse number of species? Um, do they efficiently improve, improve the water quality or protect the coastline? And then we need to think about resilience. So will the population be able to withstand change or to different stressors? Kind of thinking about all these things about the the genetic pool, the root structure if it's really shallow, and then it's also pretty species dependent. Um, finally, uh, how are we defining value? Is the value in the restoration project in carbon storage or ecosystem services, like we've talked about? 
or is it tur tourism? So each part of the restoration is really different as we can see. Um, but my part in this is evaluating carbon gains upon restoration. So kind of like a piece of the puzzle. Um, and I guess let's move on and get into that now. Uh, research time. Okay, so I work in two national marine sanctuaries and those are essentially like um, national parks, but in the ocean. So Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary covers these northern regions of California. So from, let's say, Point Arena all the way down to the bay. And it covers my sites in Tomales Bay, California, which is just below my, my research station, my laboratory in Bodega. And then um, with Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary also covers the, from the bay all the way down to Southern California. And this is where Elkhorn Slough is, and that's where I have some sites. So I also work with researchers at these sanctuaries, and uh, we think about questions together, things that they're interested in, things that I'm that things that I'm interested in, and then also we collaborate to share my work in accessible ways for the public. So a really great um, collaboration project. Um, so here is an aerial image of Elkhorn Slough. Um, Monterey, like I said, this is that little bite right here. I don't think my mouse is tracking, but the one right above Monterey. Um, and these red circles are highlighting where in the slough I am uh, taking samples and have sediment plates, which I will get into in a minute. But one thing that was super surprising when I got here myself, because I'd seen this place so many times, either by aerial images or just like pictures on the ground of this pristine, beautiful slough, was that Right along on the left side of this photo, that's actually a big highway that goes across. I guess it's only two lanes, but it seems pretty active when I'm there. And then there's also a power plant with smokestacks. And then further down, there is farm area. So this site in general is a lot more human influenced and, and has a lot more things right next to it. Um, and then also in the past, this has been a lot more human influenced. So the Army Corps actually opened up the slough to the ocean, I forget, maybe in the 1950s around then. So it used to be more fresh water and less tidally influenced, but then when they opened it up, all the seawater flooded in. And so it's changed dramatically over time. And then actually these darker areas that you can see, so around that bend in the middle, that's actually seagrass. So from what we call remote sensing or satellite imagery, we can actually detect where some seagrass meadows are if, if there's not clouds and the water clarity is good. Um, but those two larger ovals um, on the top and bottom, those are little channels that come off of the slough. And so I'm working there. And then also in the main part of the slough, kind of right next to the highway. And that's actually where there's some pretty healthy, robust um, meadows. So here is an aerial image of Tamales Bay, one of my other research sites. Um, this this scale is a little bit more zoomed out compared. You can see this one, one mile versus down here. So it's a little bit zoomed out. It's bigger. Um, and I, ha I have not started research here yet, but these are my proposed sites. So this top one where the, where the green pin is, it says Nick's Cove. This is an area where they have passive restoration going on. Um, I think I forgot to mention earlier, but Elkhorn Slough is where there's active restoration we're going on. So that's where they're actively planting and, and seeding new seagrass. Whereas in Tamales Bay, they've removed moorings, which I show those boat anchors. And so I'm going to be looking at um, restoration since then, kind of um, how seagrass has recruited. So that's that Nick's Cove area at the top. Um, in the middle, the pink pin, Cypress Grove, that's more of a natural, healthy meadow that's persisted through time. So kind of a good comparison site. And then finally, these yellow pins down at the bottom, those guys are really close to a pretty big salt marsh. And so it's it's an interesting site to look at the interactions between the two and then also where the carbon's coming from specifically in the seagrass meadows. Okay, so here are the questions that I co-created with scientists at Greater Fairlands and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We talked a bit about these earlier, but now we're going to go into more depth. So first of all, how does restoring seagrass impact sediment accumulation over one to three years? So we think about sediment accumulation because that is where the carbon is. And so if we, we can measure the sediment accumulation, we can relate that to the amount of carbon being sequestered. And then this timeline of one to three years is important because this is pretty short in terms of how we've been able to capture carbon through time. 
So in the past, we've only been able to take it at about these five to 10 or longer timescales just because of the methods that we've been using. And so I'm going to be implementing, or I have started implementing a new method that has been used on the East Coast, but it's never been used here. So it's exciting um, looking at it over these smaller timescales, specifically in the context of restoration, because these things go pretty quick. Second, how do past carbon sequestration rates differ between Elkhorn Slough and Tomales Bay? So those two sites. I mentioned when I was showing the images, the differences in human impact over time. And so that's one of the reasons why we're super curious about the carbon sequestration rates between them. Has, has human influence impacted the way that carbon can be stored um, in these restored meadows? And then finally, does carbon from neighboring ecosystems become buried in seagrass meadows? Um, specifically, these neighboring ecosystems I'm talking about are going to be salt marshes. And so we know these certain, um, what we can call fingerprints, that are assigned to each of these ecosystems. So we can actually track where the carbon is coming from. And I will get into that as we go over these research questions. Okay, so first off. How does restoring seagrass impact uh, sediment accumulation over one to three years? Just a reminder, it's carbon storage over a really short time scale. And we're looking at actively restored sites and passively restored sites, so both in Elkhorn and Tamales Bay. Okay, and hopefully I can describe this method. I've tried many a time, so hopefully this works. So we have our seagrass meadow. We go and we select a site and we need to install a sediment plate beneath the sediment. So we take this tube, it's open on the top and bottom, just a plastic tube, um, and we stick it down into the sediment. We cap it, so kind of creating suction, and then we pull out a whole tube or a whole core of dirt. Um, there, these ones that we've done so far have been about three inches in diameter and about 10 centimeters deep, so not super big. We're kind of doing this to decrease the amount of degradation and walking and removing around these areas because they're sensitive. Um, if another way to think of it is when you drink water and you have a straw and you stick it in there, you put your thumb at the top and you lift it out and all the water's still in there. That's essentially the same process we're doing here with sediment. It's a little bit more suctiony, but we get we get it out. And so once that tube is removed, we place a sediment plate. So it's a flat disc that we place at the bottom. We make sure it's flat. And then we just go ahead and reinsert that sediment right back on top. So we're looking at this third cube down here. Um, and so if you were to look from the top, you would never know that there was a sediment plate down there. But we install these metal stakes around 10 to 15 centimeters away so that way we can actually find them again, along with GPS and, and lots of other markers because these things are small and these are big places. Um, and then finally, the whole point of this is that we have these plates as kind of like points in time. So we've installed this plate and we can look at the amount of sediment on top since then and see if sediment has either um, accumulated or eroded over time by just sticking a measuring rod down there and measuring it. And I have some actual images to hopefully help um, describe what I'm saying. Um, this was actually a much, much larger plate than we're using. This one is, I think, a foot big, but this is kind of the idea of you're removing dirt, you're inserting the sediment plate, and then you put the sediment right back on top. This one was too big. We're, you know, upsetting too much stuff, so this one was not used, but um, just to get an idea. And then this is not in a seagrass meadow either. These are, these are algae around here, but just testing things out. And so here's what they look like after they've been installed and after we return a couple months later. So it's kind of hard to see because we were walking around a bit, but these are the those stakes that we put alongside them so that way you can see them from the surface. And so we have one marker at the front that kind of marks like this is where the line starts. We always install them in, in sets of three just to account for variability within the site. And then... Um, you know, kind of try to place them out all on a transect so that they go in order, but dirt moves, things like that. And so this is my colleague, Maisie, and she's down in there um, using, I don't know if you can tell, but in her left hand, she has a stake. In her right hand, she has a ruler. And then she's kind of searching for these. Some of our sites in the low tide are exposed so you can actually see the grass. Um, and then some of them in a low tide are still underwater. So they're a little bit trickier. And then next, I'm going to show a video, hopefully it plays, 
Um, but this is the, the process that I was just describing of monitoring. So we know that we've placed the plates around 10 to 15 centimeters away. So then we mark it and then we find it, you stick it in. And once it doesn't go any further, you know that you've hit the plate. Um, otherwise you just keep sinking forever because it's mud. And then we measure it. And then we do that three times just to account for variability along the plate. But that's how we do it. Um, so interesting science. Um, I'll let this play one more time just in case I think it's lagging a little bit. Um, but once again, this is my, my colleague Maisie doing this and I'm recording the data. So then here are some more beautiful images of seagrass. On the left, I don't know if you recall that I talked about that highway going across Elkhorn Slough, but that's that highway in the background. And this is that beautiful, healthy, natural meadow. And then right in the front of the image is that PVC, so marking the beginning of them. And then we have that transect, the measuring tape. And then it's even harder to see. I can barely see them, but there are the PVCs for each plate consecutively afterwards. And so right now we're searching for the plate. And so the plate size is determined because we want them to be big enough to where you're you're feeling around and you know, like that's definitely a plate, but not just hitting a shell or something like that. Um, on the right side, we have this really beautiful sea hare called Philoplesia. They are only found on seagrass and they're these really squishy, cute <laughs> uh, nudibranchs. And they're called sea hares because normally they have these little ears that come out from them. But they're they're really beautiful. There's tons of critters, as I told you before, this is kind of like a nursery habitat. So lots of babies, really cool floating things that we have yet to identify. Lots of sea otters and seals kind of curious about what we're doing. So it's beautiful. Um, these, as I was telling you, we kind of meticulously are taking notes and recording the data the whole time. They're on these slates so that nothing floats away on waterproof paper because it's messy. We also draw images of all the sites when we're there. So that way we can walk back there a couple months later and be like, Okay, this is where we were working. Let's go find some three inch plates beneath dirt. Um, but that's that. And then I included this image because at the end of the day, this is what our data worksheet looks like. Totally covered by mud. Um, still legible. You can rinse them off because they're waterproof, but this is what a good day of field work looks like. And then I also included this image. This is kind of a running joke, but now is serious because this is what we call our science wagon, this red one right here. This is actually like a red radio flyer for kids to go in, but we put all our equipment in there and it was a lifesaver because hauling all of these super heavy cores of sediment and equipment across all these places, is a little bit draining, especially when you're working against the tide and you only have a couple hours to do all this stuff. And so these are my collaborators in the blue backpack photo, that's Melissa Ward. And then right in front is Maisie Lewis, and uh, we have a great time. But if you ever see people walking around with a radio flyer, just know we're, we're doing research. We're actually doing real stuff, I promise. Um, okay, second question. How do past carbon sequestration rates differ between Elkhorn Slough and Tomales Bay? So kind of getting at that different human impact over time. So this is what I was talking about earlier with the sediment core. So this is kind of what we're doing for the sediment plates where we're removing a little bit of dirt, except we put that right back on top. This time we're actually taking it with us back to the lab. So this is what a sediment core looks like. Like I said, you shove it right down into the dirt, cap it and pull it out. And this gives us an idea of what the environment looks like through time. So kind of like those, I don't know if you remember those ice cores that I mentioned, how they were getting an idea of what the atmosphere looked like back in time. This is giving us an idea of what the, the dirt or whatever's growing in the dirt was doing um, through time. So this could essentially, I'm not sure yet, but give us maybe 150 years of data. And it's also really pretty if you look at this photo, you can see the different layers and colors. So a lot of different things happening. Um, we take a lot of these cores all throughout these sites to get, like I said, a good spatial coverage of all of them. And so here they all are back in the lab, um, taped up and cozy. They go into the freezer because if they tip around, you're kind of messing up those layers. So messing up time, essentially. So you want to make sure they stay upright and cold until you're ready to work with them. And so now we are ready to work with them. And so these are images of slicing them up. So we kind of want to get them in time intervals. So maybe from the top at zero and down to two centimeters, that's maybe like a couple of years. And so we can slice that off 
and put it into a, a little bag and then that's our our interval for that section and then we do that all along the core so we kind of have sections all the way from present day all the way down to like I said maybe 150 years and so that's what that process looks like we simply stick the core on top of what we call an extrusion device but it's just like a little flat top and it helps push the dirt out um, and then you use just a regular knife slice it off and pop it in the bag and once this is like kind of the initial processing part, it goes through a bunch of other steps. Um, we submit it to another lab actually for this particular analysis. But the end result, which we do not have yet, would essentially give us an idea of something like this. So say this core on the left is from Elkhorn Slough, and then the core on the right is from Tomales Bay. And after we went through all those things, we got a, I guess, so we got some data back that said, this core on the left from Elkhorn stores 20 units of carbon per year, whereas this um, core on the right from Tomales stores 15 units of carbon per year. So essentially, we could say that in this particular site within, within these places, this the core on the left stores more carbon, has a greater carbon stock than the one on the right. Okay, third question. Does carbon from neighboring ecosystems become buried in seagrass meadows. Um, earlier I mentioned that the, the study that showed that about half of the carbon in seagrass meadows aren't actually from the seagrasses themselves, but are from other sources all around the seagrasses. And I want to be able to test this and see what those other sources are. And more specifically, if we if another source are salt marshes. So I've kind of drawn this out here. We have our seagrass meadow up top on the left and then our salt marsh on the right. And I kind of just made the carbon from seagrasses pink and then the carbon from salt marshes blue and then as waves and tides and things mix around I kind of get this interaction going and so um, if you were to take a sediment sample you could be able to track this so um, we use this method called isotope analysis uh, just like we can do with gases in our atmosphere uh, we can trace where carbon is coming from so once again think of it like fingerprints Whoever last touched that carbon, we can sequence their fingerprints and find out who it was. So if we take a sediment from seagrass, we can find out what fraction of the carbon comes from seagrass and what fraction comes from salt marshes uh, based on their environmental fingerprint. So I kind of just made this up here as a potential example of maybe you get like a percentage that the seagrass carbon is, however, this is a little over 75%. And that the salt marsh carbon from this particular sample um, is maybe a little less than 25%. And so this information is useful in carbon credit systems and knowing kind of how carbon moves in these coastal systems and whether it actually stays buried or if it's released back into the atmosphere, um, which would be a bad thing because we want it to stay. I think someone has raised their hand. Do you want to answer that or no? You want, do you want to open it up to a question now? Sure. If it's about this slide, go for it. All right, Mary Rose, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Maybe it was by accident. You do have a question in the chat. So if Mary Rose wants to try to see if she wants to ask this, but but in dot ask, does this mean that these meadows have grown here since the Army Corps intervened? And I'm not quite sure. Oh, that's that's back at the the Elkhorn question back in that aerial image. Um, so some of the meadows might have persisted that long. They've kind of moved around over time. It's a little hard to tell because I'm basing this this information on simply aerial images from like Google Earth Pro through time. Um, and so at that time, you can kind of see seagrass meadows along the slough, but it's hard to tell if those are the same. Um, and so maybe we could track that, um, but it's all up in the air, depending on what we get back from, from the results. I can pull up that image really quick, but I think she was asking about when the Army Corps opened up this, this channel here right. about that, that data. Okay. Okay. Back to this. So yeah, that's the end of the third question. And now we are moving into kind of the what's next stage. Um, we're near the end of my talk. And so I kind of want to end with what's next for California and then also exercising some 
climate hope and positivity. Um, okay, so in California specifically, there's a lot of gaining interest in both public and private entities in seagrass and its carbon storage potential. Um, but the problem is we don't know a lot about them and our maps are not very good. So we don't know how much cover there is all along the coast um, with, with certainty. And so initiatives like 30 by 30 organizations and uh, the Ocean Protection Council are laying groundwork for more research on seagrass, which is really exciting. Um, but what do I mean by groundwork, I guess? So first, filling in data gaps, which, is, which are a lot. So contributing to databases on biogeochemical information. So kind of what's going down with like the tiny microbes in the soil and things like that. Um, improving maps or with remote sensing, so kind of like satellite imagery or other techniques, um, determining how much carbon is stored or what we call stocks. And then second, improving estimates for carbon gained through both conservation and restorations. Hopefully I can contribute to that. Um, and that so that the state can kind of determine where is best to fund and give resources to. And then finally, Estimate costs of what happens if we don't restore or conserve this plant. What are the potential damages or associated costs and kind of model different scenarios? So say we have a place that has no seagrass and a huge storm comes in and that we have to spend a ton of money on fixing the infrastructure, but what happens if we had seagrass there? And so we can kind of make models of this and see how that would work. Um, and then these priorities are largely pulled from the Ocean Protection Council's most recent report. <clears throat> Okay, so some key takeaways. We're we're at the end here, and I feel like I said a lot of things. So if this was hard to pay attention, now is the time to tune in and hear the things that I think are the most important to think about. So first off, climate change solutions are really important, and blue carbon ecosystems are going to play a critical role in this. The ocean is a super big carbon sink, and it can provide a lot of opportunities. Second, uh, continued seagrass research in the context of restoration is key in California. We know that seagrass is a federally protected species, so conservation is already underway, and that is very important, of course. But understanding if, if restoration is going to be essential needs to be um, further looked into. That's, I'm on it. <laughs> um, and then finally, we should prioritize stewardship and local knowledge of seagrass in California. It was kind of like that first poll that I mentioned. It was kind of split. And so I'm excited that hopefully I'm contributing to this, you know, shared knowledge and then also just being good stewards of the land and the ocean. Um, okay, so that was a lot, but hopefully not overwhelming, just the right amount of information to maybe inspire some hope and leave you feeling good about things. Um, a large part of why I went into marine research um, was that climate change was a really big worry for me. And so I wanted to do something that was related to climate change to hopefully, you know, aid in those worries for myself and also others. Uh, I was even in this class this past school year about how to manage climate anxiety and how to communicate science in a way that doesn't leave people feeling hopeless or sad, but kind of more so empowered and informed. And so I think it's really important to share the facts about our Earth's future while also providing these avenues for hope. Um, so I drew this little illustration just of things that I do or think are good things to exercise climate hope. And I think I will just end with that. So thank you very much. And now I'm happy to answer, answer any questions. Also this QR codes to my website and just in case. Super Elizabeth, thank you so much. That was really interesting. And we're gonna have to have you back when you finish and get that last piece of information. <laughs> Tell us what you're learning. So, I mean, from your yeah. research, do you expect that you will be able to shed light on where, I mean, uh, where restoration would be potentially more successful? I guess, I, I mean, looking at sort of the passive, so I guess, can you help me understand from the passive and the active restoration? I mean, is seagrass hardy enough that with passive recreation, it's likely to come back? Or is there just a, a, a multitude of factors that are impacting whether that, you know, water quality as well as other things, sediment quality, as why that that seagrass might not be there um, anymore? Um, yeah, definitely. I think a lot of it has to do with just simply depth. They can't, it can't grow that deep. 
there. So like I mentioned in Tamales Bay, there have been a ton of mooring removals. And actually, it was kind of been hard to find a site that there hasn't been complete eelgrass recruitment. They've all grown back, which is which is super great. The the one site that I was looking at in particular along Nick's Cove, that's an area where and that they've looked at in a minute. And so they're interested to see because last time they checked, there was still some scars. And so that's why I was interested to kind of get in that baseline of like, what does the system look like before the seagrass is there and then during as it's kind of growing and then after and just kind of compare that to a meadow that's been there for a very long time. Do we have a good data set about what seagrass historic the extent of seagrass was historically? No. No. These are though that that 90% figure that I was talking about earlier, I think I mentioned it was like potential historical cover. It's kind of using all of those different elements that allow seagrass to grow and kind of mapping that along the state and then combined with like things that we actually know to kind of get that that figure of loss. So you said that your research is sort of kind of going off of the report, the submerged aquatic vegetation. And by the way, thank you for making that distinction between seagrass and kelp, because we talk a lot about kelp and that was really great. Yes. Um, but it's all considered submerged aquatic vegetation. And there is some more, there's like, I'm correct in understanding that there's a better understanding of the sequestration potential for seagrass than there is for kelp, right? Yes. So, well, kelp is a little, is a little trickier. Yeah. Um, I get, so I'm not, a, I'm not a kelp person, but I do know. So one of the main reasons why we look at seagrass in terms of carbon storage potential is because they have these root systems that go into the sediment. And the sediment is actually the really important part at creating this long-term storage. Like it's great when it's in the plant matter, right? But when the plant dies or something happens to it, all of that carbon is immediately released back into the atmosphere. And so kelp don't have root systems. They have what we call hold fast, right? They go on, they go inside like a rocky surface. And so their roots are not reaching down to the sediment and having that like more permanent solution. So while this kelp is still alive, it's definitely, it's storing a ton of carbon all in that biomass. But the moment any of that is like ripped out or it dies, it's released back into the water, released back into the atmosphere. So some people have been doing, having ideas, right, of like a, a sinking kelp. So it goes all the way down to the bottom and it does have that more permanent effect. But I'm not sure about how robust those that that data is right now. Yeah, not robust. Yeah. <laughs> so so do you, is there anyone that's doing carbon credits with seagrass yet or is that something that you think is a is an is a natural sort of next step for some of the restoration? That is definitely a natural next step in terms of Cal I mean California is kind of like probably one of the leaders on these types of things. I don't think currently you like a company can actively go buy carbon credits which plants seagrass but there's that's why a lot of, of this is kind of I guess not oriented towards that but includes that element because it's kind of it, it includes a, a barter group of people that might be interested in their their restoration or conservation mm -hmm. okay I'll shut up now and there we have, we'll only have one question you've had lots of thank yous in the chat you know it was a great talk oh. good job you're a rock star um <laughs> Uh, but the question is, did fertilizer runoff help or hurt seagrass growth? Fertilizer runoff? I guess that kind of depends. So if there is a little and it's it's helpful for what they're doing, sure, because it's those nutrients that they need for growth. Mm -hmm. But if there's too much, not only, I mean, I guess it doesn't necessarily directly impact the seagrass because they'll kind of just take what they need, but it'll impact a lot of the things around it. So like algae will start growing in, in excess and then lead to eutrophication events, which kind of like removes all the oxygen from the area. And also if there's a ton of algae growing on top of the water, that's blocking a lot of the light coming in for the seagrass. And so I guess it, it can, it can hurt them quite a bit. Yeah. Well, okay. So I'm going to stop your share and, um, anyone who wants to, oops, what am I doing? <laughs> Sorry. Why don't you stop your share since I seem to think oh i can stop sharing yes. yes stop your share yeah there and if anyone wants to unmute yourself and ask a question directly feel free to do so now quiet crowd quiet crowd tonight <laughs> it means i did a good job or maybe a terrible job <laughs> and everyone's just confused <laughs> no i think you did a great job i i think 
I think it was an excellent introduction into this topic. And it's, you know, it's honestly, it's a great one because we talk so much about kelp and we don't hear that much about seagrass up here. And it's such an important element of our marine ecosystem. And I, I appreciate you bringing that, um, bringing that to our audience today. Oh, Bob has a, a hand up. Go ahead, Bob. How many areas along the uh, coast, West Coast would you say is uh, are uh, good sites to grow seagrass or starchy sites? Tomales Bay, uh, Humboldt Bay, any far, anything down farther south? Yeah, definitely. So like I mentioned, those different elements that are required. So areas right off the coast, so not too deep, they can, the blades are maybe about a meter to two meter max height. So kind of that, that range for water level. And then also these grow in areas that have entrances of fresh water. So they kind of need, it can't be completely saline, like salt water. It's kind of, I, I, I think I said like a Goldilocks type of thing. So they have this range of salinity where it can't be too fresh water and it can't be too salt water. So they exist in these estuary environments, which describes that water type. And so anywhere where you see kind of that fresh water entering the system and then also coastal areas where the, the coastal shelf is not too steep, those are really good candidates for where seagrass could grow. So this is just Zostra. We're not talking about philosophetics at all. And uh, it just doesn't seem that there's a hell of a lot of places that you, you can put it in. I mean, the, the, the large rivers and stuff, there's too much uh, change in the flow. And you need a quiet, nice, quiet bay, Willapa Bay, maybe up in Washington. But it uh, seems to me like you've got a very limited opportunity as far as numbers of potential sites. Yeah, definitely. I think that's also part of those those data gaps that I was mentioning. There hasn't been like a really great study of showing exactly where there's like the best candidates for all these sites. I know I mentioned that like 90% figure and you're right that that's kind of talking about all the species and I'm talking specifically about Zostra marina, which is eelgrass. Um, and so that's definitely things to think about in terms of restoration for sure. And so, what about in Florida and other country, uh, other uh, areas on, along the East Coast? What kind of uh, habitats, maybe not Zostra, but there are manatees there. What are they feeding on? Is it a, uh, a, a flowering plant that has the same sequestration value? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm, I've been kind of like narrowed in on California this whole time. I'm not too sure about other species and other areas, but that's that's definitely all the different creatures and things that depend on them. Um, I know a colleague is working in Florida and she would have maybe a little more information and I think she's here, but <laughs> I will not call on her. So, yeah. We had, uh, so somebody's pointed out that in Albion and Big River and uh, many of our river mouths and our river estuaries, we've had uh, eelgrass mm -hmm. um, habitat, seagrass habitat that we've lost over the years. It, Caring habitat and you know it'd be nice to start to look at I would love to start to look at some restoration potentials and some yeah I think also a really great, great source of information is just people who have lived here for, yeah. for ages and they know oh. like there was seagrass here at one point I know it can grow here and that is a super great source of knowledge to add be like yes this is a great potential site we also have another question before I get to you Lawrence hold on um will you be posting research updates on your website Elizabeth yes okay, I yes. have Let's been go so far, and I hope to continue. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Lawrence, go ahead. Thank you. Approximately what percentage of the San Francisco Bay would have the suitable salinity for eelgrass? And um, would it would it include, say, the South Bay or the East Bay, like next to Oakland, San Leandro, Fremont, or any of that? Or do we even, uh, do we know that or not? In ter did, are you looking for specifically in terms of salinity you mentioned? Well, just with uh, suitable, I guess it would be a combination of salinity and turbidity and, right. you know, just uh, as of now, when I look out, say at um, San Leandro and look at the bay, it looks right. It looks, it looks like it should have a uh, grass, but it doesn't, doesn't seem to grow here. Is it a potential site for restoration? Definitely. San Francisco is historically has had a large cover of eelgrass and is definitely a top site for degradation as well. Um, a lot of work has is currently going on there um i think a little bit of restoration has already begun in certain areas um 
I think at this point, it's not a great candidate just because it's so close to so much infrastructure and it's going to be hard to kind of eliminate a lot of sources of pollution and things like that. But definitely historically, there has been a, a good amount of cover. I'm not exactly sure about specific regions, though. There is quite a bit of restoration they, going on in San Francisco Bay, though. I mean, yeah. Definitely trying it. I have colleagues that are working at the restoration in Elkhorn Slough that are also working on the restoration in San Francisco Bay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you much. All mm -hmm. right. And you have another quote. Oh, oh, Gabrielle just writes that the Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife maps eelgrass every few years. It's publicly available on their bio site. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that's that's a combination of both like satellite data and then also like max extent kind of things like where could it possibly grow to its max in according to these certain thresholds and guidelines. Yeah, there's also some for Tomales Bay. I'm not sure if those are publicly accessible, but there's definitely a lot of sites along the coast that, that have started releasing this information. I, ima I imagine this is another topic that really is impacted by the now proliferation of um, drones because that, that, that image you showed change the the chains that was impactful like so that's gonna get some yeah i actually i actually was thinking I'm, I'm not an expert in remote sensing at all whatsoever but i did take a course this past quarter just because i was so curious and i went there and all of this stuff was about terrestrial stuff and i popped in there and i was like thoughts on mapping a inner tidal so sometimes exposed to air sometimes underwater plants and they were like definitely food for thought sent me a lot of things that I'm trying to decipher but we're I've... doing it with kelp you can do it <laughs> yeah it's I think it's just like program. eliminating you know certain wavelengths of yeah. whatever that's what water causes kind of thing yeah 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 I think it will be a really interesting thing mm -hmm. all right any other questions should we let Elizabeth get on to her dinner <laughs> it's wonderful to have you Elizabeth thank you so much we Appreciate all the work you're doing on these issues and sharing your time with us tonight. Um, definitely let us know when your research wraps up and we'll get you back on here and uh, you can tell us what you've learned. Uh, again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Support the Noyo Center or any of your favorite nonprofits. It's an important thing to do to keep this kind of work going. Um, our donate button is in the chat, the chat box. Um, or even yet become a sustaining member of the Noyo Center. It's a great way to support the work we do. So Elizabeth, good luck and keep in touch. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.